Hello and welcome again to the worship of Good Samaritan Presbyterian Church. It is good to have you with us here today as we turn our hearts and our minds towards considering what the word of the Lord has to say to us and as we seek to follow Jesus in this world of ours. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm number 24. Please open your ears to the song of praise that comes to us from the ancient times of Israel. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend to the house of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's pray. Lord, in your mercy, you welcome us into your courts. The gates do indeed open and the doors lift up for us as we come into your presence. And so we ask that your spirit would descend upon our hearts and that you would fill our lives with the light of your kingdom. Inspire us to hear the good news to repent, and to turn towards the grace that you are offering us and the life that you lead us into through Jesus Christ. In his name we gather and in his name we pray. Amen. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is therefore good, right, and a source of freedom for us to confess our sins because we do know that God is slow to anger and abundant in steadfast love. Our invitation to confession this morning is a a poem by Robert Frost called The Fear of God. Listen to these words, and then in a time of silence, consider what it means to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. If you should rise from nowhere up to somewhere, from being no one to being someone, be sure to keep repeating to yourself, you owe it to an arbitrary God, whose mercy to you rather than to others won't bear too critical examination. Stay unassuming, if for lack of license, to wear the uniform of who you are, You should be tempted to make up for it in a subordinating look or tone. Beware of coming too much to the surface and using for apparel what was meant to be the curtain of the inmost soul. The good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We have been set free. And we have been invited to live a life that shines with the light of the kingdom. That 
bears witness to the love and the grace we have been given. Do not hold it too tight. Do not try to control where it goes. Simply follow the good news and live in the light of Jesus Christ always. You are forgiven. The scripture this morning comes from the very different special book of the prophet Jonah. Beginning in chapter, at the beginning of chapter 3 and continuing through the 5th verse of chapter 4. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, they shall not drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered in sackcloth. They shall cry mightily to God, also turn from their evil ways and the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had that he had said he would bring upon them. He did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what Here ends the reading from God's holy word. Jonah is, in some ways, a very familiar story to us. It is one of those stories that you you learn in Sunday school class, if you're my age, probably involving a felt board in some way, shape, or form. But the the hook of the Jonah story is absolutely the the whale or or the large fish and Jonah being swallowed and saved and then vomited up on the beach. That, that's, that's the thing we remember. That's the thing that, that even the most biblically illiterate people probably know about Jonah, is the whole thing about the big fish. But what most people don't know is that Jonah is, as I said, very unusual in terms of the, the, the writings that we have in the Bible. And, you know, the Bible contains all different kinds of literature. It contains poetry like the Psalms. It contains songs. It contains love poems. It contains wisdom. It contains books of history that tell you who begat whom ad nauseum. It contains books of law. It contains stories of, of the ancient people like Job. It contains many, many volumes of prophecy. Of, and the, those prophecies take different forms. And Jonah gets, Jonah gets stuck there in, in the middle of the minor prophets, right between Micah and Obadiah. And, you know, 
maybe we maybe we don't always necessarily pay too much attention to what it actually is because Jonah doesn't fit with what we in modern times think we should find in the Bible. Jonah is an example of satire. Jonah is 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 meant the story of Jonah is meant to be funny. And and it is, honestly, if you read it, if you consider what it says, it it's actually quite hilarious. <laughs> A, 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 a prophet, and not a very good one at that, is called by God to go to Nineveh, which is strange because Nineveh is not an Israelite city. It's, it's a foreign city. You know, Jonah, Jonah is not a prophet in the mold of, of Isaiah or Jeremiah. Those, they were serious fellows, <laughs> even though there, there were some, you know, sometimes some humor injected into their prophecies. Jonah, from the very beginning, is is not a is not a harbinger of God's voice. Jonah is is more like the like if the Three Stooges did a version of one of the biblical prophets. He tries to run away from God. Even bad prophets know better than that. He gets miraculously saved and 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 fi- seems finally to repent, only to seriously misunderstand what God was all about. And then he has the gall to be mad about it. And the story never does actually resolve with Jonah finally repenting. For all we know, and he remains bitter and angry to the end of his days. And you might actually notice that if, if you read all four chapters of Jonah to, in, in its little spot in the Minor Prophets. But... The only time most people would read that is if they're stuck in a motel during a hurricane and the TV is out and all they have to read is the Gideon Bible tucked into the nightstand. So most people just stick with the story of the fish and call it a day. They say that the story of Jonah is about how you can't run away from God so you shouldn't try. That's true. That's only the first half of the story. And it's not really the most important part of the story because... If you just read that part, you might think that Jonah Jonah runs away, to, tries to run away to Tarshish because he just is afraid to go to Nineveh because Nineveh is, is a faraway place that he's unfamiliar with. But here in, in this section, we find out that the reason why Jonah really didn't want to go to Nineveh is because he was afraid that God might actually forgive them. <laughs> he was worried about that. That's what he says. That may be, uh, you know, after the fact rationalization, <laughs> but I don't think so. See, this is not a story about how you can't run from God. It's a a story about how we tend to make God far too small. And we tend to to totally misjudge God's character. I mean, Jonah Jonah knows he can't run from God. And and if he had any doubt about that, he found out. He found out when he he sinks down and, and goes into... The, the belly of the of the whale of the fish for three days, and he and he prays his his probably his most eloquent speech is the form of the prayer in the belly of the fish, and then he comes through the ordeal, smelling like fish vomit, and it doesn't really improve that much from that point. In fact, if anything, from that point on, Jonah actually gets worse, if you can believe that. It, it's not just him trying to run away from God, but now he sets himself against God. Even in the midst of doing what God is compelling him to do, he doesn't do it very well. And the reason is because, quite frankly, Jonah is a racist. He's a xenophobe. He is afraid, and he doesn't like, and I would go so far as to say he even hates the people of Nineveh. He may have had good reasons to do so. And this period of the prophets in the ancient times, that it, it's all so very tribal. Kingdom against kingdom, city against city, state. I mean, you know, the, the idea of, of a nation that, that is made up of multiple ethnicities and, and, and all different kinds of people was unheard of. And Nineveh was, a, as it says, a vast city. It takes three days to walk across it. That's, that's pretty big. You can walk across Washington, D.C. In, in probably the better part of one day if you, if you keep a pretty good pace. So Nineveh, by, by, 
virtue of being a great city and being a vast city, that also means they're a threatening city. Because how does a big city support itself in, in ancient times? It does so by raiding smaller kingdoms and going out into the countryside and pillaging. It's, it's a pretty safe bet to say that to a, a prophet of Israel, Nineveh, Gentile city of such size and impressiveness is a threat. It can't not be a threat. It's always going to be a threat in that world. And so when God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and give him the message, he has some choices to make about how he's going to give him that message. A good prophet would say, you have 40 days and God's judgment is going to come unless you repent. See, that's the thing. Prophets are not just about being harbingers of doom. Prophets are always about trying to get people to turn to God. And in, in the case of a city like Nineveh, that seems like a quite unlikely thing because they, they don't seek the face of the God of Jacob. They've got their own gods. And Jonah shows up, and he doesn't even give them the full prophet treatment. He just gives them the first part. He gives them the crazy guy on the corner with the sign saying the end is near version of what a prophet is. He just comes in and says, 40 days and you're going to be done for. You're going to be overthrown. That's it. Sorry to be you. I'm, you know, I'm telling you because God made me tell you, but now I'm out. But something happens. Something remarkable, honestly, happens for prophets. They listen to him. They listen fast, and they listen hard, and they get the message well. The people in the street repent. All right, we're, whoever your God is, we're sorry we've offended him. We're going to change our ways. And not only the people in the street, but the king himself. And, and they, don't have it, they don't even have the promise. They don't have any sort of glimmer of hope from what Jonah told them that they have a chance to be saved. The king says, oh, all right, well, everybody, the, the men, women, children, animals, everybody is going to repent. We are going to humble ourselves, and maybe, maybe God will, will spare us. Maybe, who knows? We can't say, but... But if we, if we repent of the evil that is in our hands, the violence that is in our hands, maybe there's a chance. That, that is remarkable. And, and that, you know, that, that's, 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 a, that's rare among, our, among us humans, for us to just hear somebody say, you know what, you, you, you folks are all really in for it. This God that you may or may not believe in is coming to strike you down. Jonah tries to make it sound as absurd as possible. Because he doesn't, he, these are his enemies. He doesn't want them to be forgiven. He wants the hammer to come down on them. He is, he, you know, we all know how this feels. Whether it was classmate that you didn't care for or a sibling. I mean, look, everybody who has brothers or sisters knows that when, you're, when your sibling is being, is being a jerk and they get in trouble, mom and dad yell at them for being a jerk and you, it, the rest of you, oh, oh, oh yeah, that's, that, look, it's, I'll admit, that's a great feeling. When, when the other people get in trouble, <laughs> That that's, there's something there's something primal about how how good that makes you feel, you know. The, the Germans have that word Scheidenfreude, which is you know it's a great word. It means the joy that you feel about the misfortune of others. But when when that misfortune is is something that they bring on themselves because they deserve it, ooh, ooh, that's that's like cake and ice cream right there. That that's wonderful stuff. Imagine on the scale of, you know, a, 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 a man 
from a, from a small and, and, and throughout most of its history, fairly vulnerable nation collection of tribes, if you will, like Israel. I mean, they're always getting beat up by somebody or another. They're always getting invaded. They're all, I mean, they, 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 are, they, are the, they are the ones who get raided all the time by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And, you know, they, they run into trouble with the Egyptians way back in, you know, pretty much all through. All the, the, the world is hostile to them. Why would God send a prophet to, to their enemies? Why? why? Why give them the warning? Why not just let the hammer come down? Because, you know, I mean, when your enemy gets it, and they get what's coming to them, it feels good. Now, it, it does bear notice that the Ninevites don't just get away with it. God just doesn't doesn't say, ah, you know what, there's, there, there's just so many of them, I don't feel like smiting them all. You know, they, they, they actually repent of what they're doing wrong. They actually notice, like, yeah, you know what, we, we've done some evil and there's violence in our hands, we have blood on our hands. We need to repent of that. We can't go along doing things this way. I'd be willing to bet. I'd be willing to bet there are a lot more Jonas out there in the world than people who are actually ready for what God's mercy might actually do. And in fact, I know there are. And see, here's here's the thing about Jonah as a story. Unlike Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Elijah and Elisha, there's no evidence that Jonah was actually a real person. <laughs> Jonah. This, this whole incident is, is, can be interpreted more or less as a parable. It's a little longer than your average parable, but that's what it is. It's a parable. It's, it's, it, it's not written to Nineveh. This is not a letter that, that, that somebody sent to Nineveh and said, you know, pay attention to this story. This is going to teach you something. No. This, this is directed at Israel. And that's what prophets do. They speak to their own people. They speak to the people who follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they try to tell these people something about God. It's a parable for the Hebrews. It's meant to tell them that their idea of God is too small. It's meant to challenge their tribalism and their racism and their xenophobia. It's meant to challenge the idea that there, that there should be this hard animosity between them and the nations. Because, remember covenant with Abraham, you are to be a blessing to the nations. Not this hard little conclave of people that just holds on to what they have and never grows and never blooms and never flourishes out there in the world. The, the vision that, that the prophets have of how good things will be when people sit under their own vines and they, they, they never have to fear is never going to come by, by, through tribalism or nationalism. Not going to work. The only the only way that that vision will ever come true is if we realize, as a species, as all of humanity, that we are connected to one another, and that our commonwealth depends on each and every one of us having those blessings. You you, you can't want to destroy the pagans who don't acknowledge your God. You. you you can't want your God to drive them out before you and destroy them. In that, in that sense, in the sense that Jonah believes that that's what's going to happen, that Jonah is, is not a rare person. He's a fairly average one. He is, he is a good clown. He, he, is, he is the, the caricature of a person that God is trying to change who just refuses to be changed. Even if miraculous things happen to him, even if the, if he's swallowed into, if swallowed by a great whale, lives there, lives in his belly for three days, and and gets vomited up on the beach, and even if he goes and has a city of hundreds of thousands of people listen to his poorly delivered prophecy and repent, 
he still goes out and he sits down in his little booth and he gets mad. And he throws a tantrum. He says, it's not fair. It's not fair. I knew you were going to do this. That's why I didn't want to go in the first place. I mean, look. This is, the Israelites need to learn this lesson. But we do too. We, 21st century Christians need to learn this lesson, as did 17th century Christians, as did, as did 12th century Christians. The, the fact that anyone who follows Jesus would see the, the mercy and steadfast love of God as shocking or surprising or, or insulting, even... It's, that's that's kind of pathetic. But, alas, many who claim to follow Jesus seem to be in the same boat as Jonah. And, and, and you know, maybe, maybe that's a boat that needs to sink. Maybe it needs to go down in that storm. It, here's an example that, that's a little bit more current and up to date. And, and it's from a few years back. They, there was a pastor of, of what I would call a, an evangelical megachurch, Mars Hill. His name is Rob Bell, and you may have heard of him. He's been in the news, I, but you sort of have to pay attention to like sort of vaguely churchy news. He, you know, he's been, been you know, on Oprah, I think, once or twice, and, and he's done some stuff with Richard Rohr, who you know I'm kind of fond of. But he wrote this book. It wasn't a long book. It's a book you can probably read in you know a couple hours if you if you really set set to it it's called love wins and he questions the history and the theology of hell as a place of eternal punishment and look isn't i i i knew this book was going to be somewhat controversial before i read it i had heard that it was going to be and and i sort of went into it even though i i kind of i had listened to rob bell and liked some of his sermons i Thought, well, you know, maybe he's gotten a little too full of himself with the, with the being famous, you know, 10,000 member church pastor kind of a guy. And yeah, maybe, maybe he's become a heretic. And I sat down to read it. <laughs> now, I, granted, I sat down to read it with a little bit more of a theological background than most people. But what I found was that his interpretation of Scripture in this little book of his was. Um, far from being heretical, what I would consider to be fairly conservative, as a matter of fact, he cites scripture as extensively and steers right down the middle of what I would call modern theological orthodoxy. He keeps to the Gospels. He's, he's not you know, digging in, in the dark corners of the minor prophets or even going that much into Revelation. He, he's talking about Jesus' message of the, of the love of God overcoming the sin of the world. And his premise is, the premise, which is actually not a new premise, it's been around since, well, the beginning of the church, quite honestly, is that God's not going to lose. God's love is more powerful than sin, it's more powerful than death. It's not going to lose. In the grand scheme of creation in the universe, God's love is the reason why everything is, and it's the only thing that really matters. And so... In that scheme of things where God's love is the source of everything and all that is, how is eternal punishment even an option that's on the menu? Like I said, not a new idea. Uh, in some ways I thought he, he had just gone back and dusted off some old, you know, Origen or Jerome from like the, like the second and third century, even before the Council of Nicaea, and sort of told it in a, in, a, in a sort of skinny jean hipster kind of a way. And, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> I knew he was about to get himself in trouble because I knew that what he was saying would, might get me in trouble as the pastor of a mainline Presbyterian church, but from in his little corner of the church, which is evangelical and, you know, more literalist and I think a bit more conservative, despite the skinny jeans, they... they <laughs> I knew he was going to get in trouble. He did. <laughs> he got, you know, there were all kinds of people out there calling him a heretic. And, and most of the people that were calling him a heretic, I, I actually think they're the, they, they kind of are the heretic because they're the, the, you know, prosperity gospel, the world is going to end kind of people. 
they're, they're the Jonas, honestly. They're, they're the ones who say, that, oh, wait, it's not fair. Love, you, you gotta, there's got to be some kind of consequences for our messed upness. I, it was interesting, though. Because I, I was not at all shocked by anything that, that Rob said. And I, and I also was not shocked at the response of American Christianity. And I say American Christianity because it's a certain kind. It's not everybody. It's, 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 it, it, but it was a lot. He, he had to leave Mars Hill, the church he founded, and the church that he was so intimately associated with. Now he's doing fine. He's writing, he's hanging out with Oprah, he's surfing. He's doing pretty well for himself, honestly. But the thing that, that I found interesting about Love Wins, when I read it for the first time, is basically, basically, he's just restating the lesson of the book of Jonah in expanded form and showing how it connects to Jesus. And he doesn't actually do that Explicitly, he doesn't use Jonah as his as his overall like frame, but that's what the the message that Jonah was telling people, whether it's the people of Israel or the people of twenty first century America, is that you have no right to make God as small and angry and bitter as you are, and when you do so. You not only are harming your own soul, but you are harming this creation that God is working for. This creation that is good. This creation that is becoming a new creation. When, when, when you play the part of Jonah and you sit in your booth and you say, that's not fair. And you criticize God for his love and his mercy and his abundant, steadfast love. Who do you think you are? Fish vomit? I mean, come on. Who do you think you are that you can tell God who's in and who's out? Who do you think you are that you can turn your judgmental eye upon one of God's children and say that they are damned? Why in the name of a giant fish that swallows people whole do people try to run away from God's mercy? Why? Our hate, our hate is just so deep. We, we, we want to have enemies so very badly. But even when those enemies turn and say, I'm sorry, we, we did wrong, why would we not want God to redeem them? Do we really think the only way those people are going to learn is through fire and wrath? Why, if we, if we really believe in the love of God, would we want anyone to meet eternal destruction rather than a gracious God who is merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love? Why would we imagine God, we followers of Jesus, why would we imagine God to be any different than the father of the prodigal who welcomed them home? Why would we think that God's grace is somehow unfair when it is given to others after we ourselves have been given that grace in the darkest belly of the, of the fish? Do we not read Jesus' parables about the prodigal and about the early and the late workers and about, and about how the kingdom of heaven works? Why, why is this news to us? Why is it shocking to us that love might win? Does it, look, does it seem to you when you listen to the, the, the noise that comes from the church in this world of ours? Do, do you see how many people who claim to know Jesus are just out there shouting 40 more days and it's all? And, th and that noise clashes against those of us who are proclaiming the love of God. Trying to say, look, 
mercy is out there. Steadfast love is there for you. Just grab a hold of it. Trust me, there are plenty of people who are going to shout 40 more days and everything is going to be over. And some of them write books and some of them lead big churches. They're wrong. They're Jonah. And Jonah is not the prophet you want to be like. Pick another one. Even pick one you don't know much about. Pick Obadiah. Pick Micah. Micah's a good one. I mean, even if you're a little on the cranky side, pick Amos. If, if you're, you're, you're a little crazy, pick Jeremiah. If, if, you, if you like high church stuff, pick Isaiah. Pick somebody else besides Jonah, because Jonah is not the one you want to imitate. Jonah's a clown. Jonah's a joke. Jonah never learns his lesson. He, he begins the story and he ends the story smelling like fish vomit. When I hear people go on about an angry God who is about to strike us down, I could practically smell that fish vomit. But I hold on to this truth. Fortunately, even Jonah knew God's character wasn't like that. Even a bad prophet knows in his heart that God's mercy is going to win, that God's love is going to conquer, that his abundant, steadfast love is what matters. There are plenty of people who might tell you that God is going to get you because you're a heretic or you're a bad person or you're a sinner Blah, 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 blah. You're Nineveh, blah, blah, blah. You're Babylon, you're Assyria. <clears throat> Fortunately, the one who actually has the power to hold your life in their hand and your eternity in their heart is not such a jerk. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your abundant steadfast love. And we pray, Lord, <clears throat> that we would feel that in our darkest places. And we would know it was there, but then when, when we are spit back up on the beach and we go along our way, we would not so quickly forget that grace that was given to us. We would not put it, tuck it away and say, well, it, that, that's great for me, but not so much for these other people, because man, look at them. We pray, Lord, that we would then have that grace in us, always, so that we can be abundant in mercy and steadfast love, so that we can be gracious and we can, we can call people to follow in, in, in a way that is full of grace and truth, not full of anger and judgment. Lord, if it comes to a choice between holding on to our, our hatred and embracing your love, let us always choose the love. Because it is in love that this universe was made, and it is in love that it exists, and it is in love that it is redeemed, and it is in love that one day it will shine in glory. It's the only way it works. And Lord, <clears throat> even as we see so many places and so many people that seem to cry out for justice, Show us again that your justice is about restoration, not punishment. Show us again that your justice is about redemption and not destruction. People who know Jesus have seen this throughout the ages. It's not a new idea. It didn't come to us just recently because of some clever person. It, it was there all along. Jonah's were there as well. People who just couldn't deal with the abundance of your love 
in the depth of your mercy. You didn't accept it, maybe because they didn't feel it themselves. But it was there for them, and it was there for it is there, it is here for us. And so, Lord, in awareness of that grace and that peace, we put ourselves in your hands and we trust in the depth of your spirit and the breath that breathes into our lungs. And what lifts us up out of the pit and sets our feet upon the firm foundation of your grace is that Holy Spirit which has been with your people throughout all the ages and has shown us the way to go and given us the light of Christ who has taught us as his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> you go nowhere by accident. Wherever you're going, God is sending you. Wherever you are now, he has a reason for you to be there. Jesus Christ, who lives in you, has something he wants you to do right here, right now, where you are. Believe this. Go in his grace, his mercy, his love, and his power. And God's people said,